micro nano education for everyone. Um, I just want to introduce Anne the Healer. Um, she's like the expert in business e industry leadership team formation, and she's going to just talk to us about um, forming an, a built team and, and kind of best practices in, in how to do it. So Anne, thanks for giving the presentation and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I'm very, very happy to be with you today. And thank you everyone for taking your precious time and joining us. I am the originator of the built model. I will be giving you just a little bit of context about how I came about coming up with this model. It was kind of one of those necessity things, but it has blossomed and evolved over the last 16, 17 years. And now there are whole colleges using the model. Uh, lots of the National Science Foundation centers and major projects are using the model. And I'm just real excited because I know it's working. Okay, so this is part one of two. And part two, I think the recording did okay. So what we will do is refer you to that recording for the rest of the story, if you were not involved. Uh, in this section, we're gonna talk about the context for the built, why I did it, who benefits, the absolute essentials. There are details that we do that maybe aren't required, but some of the essentials are required or you really lose the benefit of having a leadership team. We'll talk about co-leadership. We'll also talk about the super built, discipline built model for MinTech and other large centers. We'll talk about who can be built members or who should be built members and how to re recruit them. We'll clarify differences between the built model and the advisory council in the words of our built chairman. And we will ensure, uh, talk about ensuring how the faculty and staff understand and are engaged in the process because it's very often that faculty get a little concerned that the business people may be taking over curriculum. Not so, faculty are 100% in charge of curriculum, but they will be better informed by using this process. Then we'll talk about inviting people and how to come up with the pro forma knowledge, skills, and abilities that the businesses will vote upon. Part two is the rest of the story. I'm not gonna go over it in detail. There is a recording. What's a built? It is an advisory council on steroids because the business team actually co-leads the work using a structured and repeatable process. That's very, very important because uh, when they own the project or feel like they co-own the project or the, the program or the NSF grant that you're working on, you will get incredible levels of engagement with them. This is a picture of, quote, the good old days when we were able to meet together in a room. That was wonderful. What wasn't wonderful is this is before we had a method for electronic voting. And so it was very, very slow. So we're real excited that we now have uh, electronic voting and it's quite a bit faster. The origins, I was hired as Dean right after 9-11. In fact, I interviewed on the 13th of September in 2001. And then right before the dot-com bust. I don't know if you were involved in IT at that time, but it, there, it's kind of like now, there are so many open jobs in IT, there's just absolutely no way under the sun that they're all gonna get filled. And then suddenly we had dot-com bust, it fell apart. I was hired to grow enrollment and there's no one who could have grown enrollment in that environment. My choices were to give up and wait it out. Well, anybody who knows me knows that's not likely something I'm going to do. I could have downsized the programs and I would have been firing half of the faculty. And we are not a union state. That would have been something that I could have been forced to do. But I didn't want to do that because the faculty had a lot of skills that I felt like we were going to rebound in IT in the nation. And in fact, um, it would be a, a good idea to keep them around. So the problem was how do we figure out how to plan for the future? And oh, by the way, how do I fund the faculty until the industry came back? Other contributing factors, we had a small NSF project grant, just a little bitty one. 
and had a good reputation with NSF. I also had worked with AACC and Microsoft in the late 90s, early 2000s to try to implement, not to try to, we did help implement 63 IT programs across the nation. So I knew that at least those 63 were gonna be in the same pickle that we were in, that they were going to need to do something too or lay off faculty. And so I started doing some surveys with AACC's list of colleges and realized that at least half of the then 1150 colleges were in the same position of being in trouble. And again, I had to believe in the future for IT and ET. This was a time frame when the jobs were being offshored and the thought was, oh, we can get everything cheaper overseas. Um, but I didn't think that would work long term. I just didn't think it would and it didn't. And in education, typically we normally have to scramble to respond to the changes that industry wants. So we had an opportunity to apply for a National Science Foundation Regional Center. Uh, we were always national focused, even though we were based regionally in North Texas. And we worked with the business and industry to do the KSAs for them to predict the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they would want to hire when the industry came back. And we were had time to create the curriculum. You know, I look back at that. It was a little bit of a perilous time, but it was actually pretty good because with the NSF funding, I was able to keep my faculty. And we also had ready curriculum when the industry came back. So now we are a national built. I won't go into the details on that, but basically we had the regional for two rounds and the national. We're in our ninth year for the national. We lead over 80 universities and colleges. Uh, they participate in the national built uh, just as listeners mostly. In fact, we're having our national built meeting tomorrow to prioritize the KSAs. The local institutions have their own local or regional built so that they can customize it for their locale. Uh, and I want to highlight that every single thing we do as a part of the CTC depends on the foundational knowledge we get from the businesses. You can change the name to built because business advisor council means something, especially to funders. They tend to think that business advisory councils are rubber stamp organizations and are not necessarily very engaged with the businesses that are involved. Approach benefits lots of people, students, faculty, built members. Students ultimately are sought out by the built members because the, they know what kind of courses they have taken. They know that the knowledge and skills that they have are very likely going to be important for them. Uh, the built members mentor the students. Uh, you know, I think one of the saddest things is people who are students who enroll in a program and think they want to be, for example, uh, a networking specialist or a cloud specialist. And then they get into it and realize the money's good, but it really doesn't fit. So our built members will agree, even though we're national, they will agree to mentor people all over the United States. And they will also help with all sorts of events like interview skills, day in the life videos, uh, resume review, et cetera. Faculty, I really believe faculty want to teach the absolute best information to their students, or in, maybe it's not to provide the best information to their students. The built members can be guest speakers and assist with recruitment events. Uh, they also can alert us of trends. You'll see as we get into this that we do the knowledge, skills, and ability prioritization. prioritization. We do that once a year, but we have trends meetings three other times a year, and that allows us to get ahead of the curve on the new things that are coming in the future. The built members also provide free or reduced training for faculty. We have something called working connections every summer. This year we have six tracks. We already have, I think, 160 people registered because it's virtual, uh, but we always have one or two of those tracks that are funded by the, the businesses. Uh, they also can provide internships, internships and externships for faculty. Belt members benefit because there's a wider pipeline of ready skilled individuals. Um, they also develop professional relationships with one another. 
the smaller concerns oftentimes really want to be involved with the larger company representatives so that they can hear what they see happening in the future. Gives them a chance to give back and their time is definitely valued in this process because we provide a very detailed feedback loop with them. Here are the two most slides coming up, most important slides coming up. Bare bones essentials of the process. The businesses have to be allowed to co-lead programs, not whole departments, not divisions, typically by quarterly meetings. What happens is the prioritized uh, KSAs, the knowledge, skills, and abilities uh, that they prioritize um, are, must be, I'm not saying this well, sorry, you can have to edit this part out. The sub, you need to have subject matter experts to prioritize the knowledge, skills, and abilities. The people voting on these items need to really have an idea of what the future holds with respect to each of those items. We also use a structured and repeatable voting process so they always know what they're gonna do. It's not new for them every time. And it's not just a discussion, although there is a discussion once the votes are in, but the votes actually guide the discussion. It's also important for the business people to predict labor market demand. I know we have information from Bureau of Labor Statistics, from MC, Burning Glass, lots of different places, but it's very important for them, the very people that are on your built team, to weigh in and say what they see happening in the industry, because sometimes they find something going on that, in fact, we have not thought about yet. It's also really important that they predict the trends. Greg, I see you put your camera on. Do you have a question? No, I don't. I just, uh, I'm just ah, back. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you. Not a problem. I wanted to check with you though. Okay. Do we have questions about this part from anyone on uh, the call? The essential part is that those people who guide your curriculum have to be subject matter experts. In terms of what faculty do, faculty must use those cross-reference KSAs and cross-reference them to existing curriculum. Now, I will hasten to add that we do have major discussion going on in the meeting. So it's important that the faculty also take that into account. They can go ahead and update the curriculum to address the KSAs and provide feedback, or if there are some of the prioritized KSAs that just can't be done, maybe it requires a lot of money to be spent on equipment, or maybe it requires an adjunct professor uh, being able to teach something that is an emerging technology, that's possible. Anyway, very long story short, if something cannot reasonably be done, then the faculty bring that back to the bill to discuss and figure out how to uh, handle it. Essential element is co-leadership. It is not them telling us what to do. It's not educators telling them what we're going to do. It's working together to align the program so that the employers want to hire the graduates. They are willing to spend the time and the estimated time I usually say is on the order of seven or eight hours a year to do the prioritization and to do the trends meetings. They are willing to do that if we respect their time for example, if I ask for an hour, even if we're not finished at the end of the hour, we're finished. We handle any other business via email. It's also important that the feedback loop be there to provide them feedback on what we have done with what they spent their time telling us about. Take a moment to consider the typical business advisory team. Think about whether they're really highly engaged, whether they co-lead or just advise. And oh, by the way, do you always take advice you receive? Do they prioritize the knowledge, skills, and abilities and hold discussion after it using some process that's repeatable? Do they talk about labor market demand and do they predict trends? And then do faculty take that information and actually make sure that it applies to the curriculum? You know, maybe the answer is yes to all of this. If so, that's unusual. But I will tell you that the built model will answer yes to all these questions. 
what, now, how do we meet? One face-to-face -face meeting a year via Zoom. That's where we prioritize the KSAs. The meeting is two to four hours annually, depending on the number of knowledge, skills, and abilities to be considered. Our meeting tomorrow is three hours long, uh, and that includes time for the vote. Then we're, uh, we recommend two or three other meetings. We have three, and ours are an hour and a half long where they talk about industry trends. Sometimes these are trends that are five or six years down the road. For example, we talked about software-defined networks very, very early on, something like six or seven years ago. And I kept asking the business folks, what are we supposed to do to our curriculum to reflect what you are talking about? Well, initially, they really weren't sure what we needed to do to the curriculum. But as they progressed year after year, it got a little bit clearer each year. Also, uh, Faculty can provide feedback regarding the prioritized KSAs and how they're implemented. Faculty can ask for advice. You can also present on items that are related to your National Science Foundation project or anything else that's going on in your program. And this is the time in the, the trends meetings when we like to ask the business people for their help in optional activities such as panels, such as mentoring, such as supporting professional development. I don't ask them for everything at the very beginning. I don't want to run them off. A suggestion for Mintech is since there are several sub-discipline areas involved in Mintech, uh, we're at this point considering having a super built. The super built is basically the business people from all the disciplines meeting together to guide the grant workshop or grant employer relationship overall. Then one KSA analysis meeting per sub-discipline and those sub-disciplines aren't fully defined yet. Um, the member colleges would then be trained to adopt or adapt the built model to localize the information that the national provides. And then two trends meetings and the trends discussion would cover all the areas and Faculty and grant staff can ask questions, uh, present, all sorts of things go on at the trends meetings. Makeup of the ideal build. You need to have high level technical executives if you possibly can, because those folks are responsible for keeping their companies in business. So they better know what's coming down the pike in terms of technologies. First line hiring managers, they are very important because they're the ones who are gonna do the hiring from your students. And then technicians, I limit those to people that have graduated from programs nationwide in our case, um, or from the, your college, if you're doing it for your college. I usually like to have them basically provide testimonials about how it worked for them in the program, how they're doing in their career, because that is confirmation to the belt members that what they've been investing their time doing really works and uh, helps the students. The one thing I would say is we don't have the HR representatives as the sole representative for a business. And the reason is that the HR rep gets their information about technical content secondhand. The faculty are ex officio members. They are primarily active listeners. And you could have a chairperson write off, but it's not necessary. It, I actually like selecting a chairperson after about a year because the leaders among your belt members will bubble to the top. Suggested makeup, again, highly experienced people who have the future pulse of the industries for Mintech. And again, the faculty are ex officio members of all of the belt teams. Suggested makeup. Uh, again, the emphasis on the subdisciplines is to make sure that the belt members are truly subject matter experts. And they have to be people who are looking out for future technologies because we're not very fast at implementing curricular changes. And again, it could include, just like for the super built, it could include high level tech executives, et cetera. Um, and faculty primarily are active listeners. How do you find the local uh, 
belt members or new belt members. And it's not necessarily local, it could be on a national level. Once you have a kind of a core group of belt members, they will recommend their colleagues in the industries. That works like a charm. However, it's important to get started. And in getting started for a national center, it's important to talk to the member colleges and see if they can recommend business advisory council members that are highly engaged and other professional contacts. Those folks would be prime candidates for joining the centers built. Also, you can work with those college administrators from the member colleges and even with board members, although if you're working with board members, I would highly suggest going through their president because I know at least at the colleges where I've worked, it was not okay for me to go to a board member directly. Also chambers of commerce are able to help, EDCs can help, associations that are regional or national can help. Uh, and then again, network with your network. Ask the people that are from the member colleges to network with their own network of business contacts to come up with prospective people for these various built teams. This is from our built chairman. Um, he's uh, comparing and contrasting advisory versus business led teams. Uh, advice can be ignored. If you put them in a leadership role, then it requires that whatever they think they want you to do or prioritize that they want you to do, that you either need to do it or discuss with them why it's not possible. Over on the right-hand side, you will see, this is from the chairperson or chairman. His uh, comment is that the KSAs are absolutely required. Eh, not so much. In reality, they're highly, highly recommended but ultimately it's up to a given college whether or not it's possible to implement those particular KSAs. The curriculum can be recognized by the BILT and this is something on a national level that we've done. We have allowed colleges to bring their curriculum to the BILT and they've been able to review that curriculum based on the KSAs that they prioritize. And I have feedback forms for that if you're interested. One of the big reasons they like this approach is that it reduces the cost for on the job training because they feel like the employees are better aligned if they choose them from a program supported by their built. And remember faculty involvement and understanding is important. Faculty still control curriculum. Using the built mom model, they just have better information to work on, but ultimately faculty do report that their programs are stronger if they work with a build. They do need to prioritize those KSAs to the existing curriculum and determine gaps. And the gap could be a whole course, especially if you're coming up with a rather new uh, variation on a theme for a curriculum or even a, a whole new curriculum. Uh, there will be whole courses that are uh, involved in the gap. Otherwise, enhancements could be something as simple as adding a module to an existing course. But regardless, the feedback has to go to the built and they need to problem solve with you on anything that you cannot handle. Again, maybe it's equipment that costs too much that's needed, or maybe it's having the expertise to teach the class. Inviting built members, both super and sub built, determine their WIFM. You'll hear me talk about the WIFM regularly, but what's in it for me for each of the built members? It may be that they want a wire pipeline of qualified individuals. In fact, that's probably the most prevalent reason. But again, I mentioned that the smaller built members or smaller companies involved in the built may want to socialize uh, on a professional basis with some of the larger company representatives. That's also a very real reason for their WIFM. Whatever their WIFM is, is important. And I do call my belt members about mm, once a year, once every 18 months and ask them how things are going and try to determine what kind of WIFMs may be added to their list so we can make their participation be very, very valuable to them. 
You also need to formulate a letter or a phone script to use in recruiting the BILT members, maybe both. And I highly suggest that you invite your members via printed letters and emails now that we are still working remotely in many cases, and then follow up with phone calls. Start with the BILT model in the letter. What are you doing? What's different about what you're suggesting that you're gonna do? It's a co-leadership model, not an advisory model. It's structured, it's repeatable, it's future focused, and it uses three to four meetings a year to align curriculum. And I customize the letter, believe it or not, for each of the BILT members if I know they're with them. If I don't know they're with them, I'm going to focus on widening the pipeline of qualified individuals to hire. I have a sample letter that was used by a college welding program. Let me pull that up here. I have to stop sharing and I'm going to stop and ask for questions here while I do this. Yes, Ann, I do have a question yes. for you. Sure. Uh, is there a term of service for your built members? Oh, no. Well, an experienced built member needs to stay on for life. Uh, as long as they are in a position where their career is still advancing and they're uh, beneficial to you and to them. I never fire anyone. It turns out that over time, if someone maybe has retired and been retired long enough, they will self-eliminate. Uh, but no, no term. I would have them um, stay as long as they're willing to be helpful. In fact, our current chairman has been our chairman now for six or seven years. Uh, and the previous chairman uh, is actually still on the team, but after eight or 10 years of being the chairman, his job took him to Europe, actually to Ireland, uh, three weeks out of four. So it made it pretty difficult for him to still be the chairman of the team. Does that make sense? Absolutely, thank you. So, okay, all right. Value proposition letter, email or phone script, we're aware that there's a gap and we're implementing the business and industry leadership team. We need you to identify the future knowledge, skills and abilities that you think you're gonna want. Tell them the time commitment as I did right here. I said about eight hours annually, four meetings annually, a KSA analysis meeting and three one hour virtual trends. Interestingly enough, the KSA meeting, actually my, my chairman in, reminded me, we used to start at 8.30 and go all day when we were voting by hand. So it's really speeded up the process to have the voting be done electronically. And then I ask who can do this? Who, who can join us for this meeting? Uh, and it, usually it works pretty well. Um, you can have an orientation meeting and I can share those slides too. That would be a meeting that's a little bit shorter than the KSA meeting. And if you're not scheduling the orientation meeting, you would change the last paragraph. I don't know if you can read fast enough to, to know what questions you might wanna ask at this point, anyone? It's just a pro forma letter that you can indeed change. Do plan to follow up on your RSVPs. Ask for the RSVPs in the letter, but realize that people don't read well. Um, everybody gets more emails than they possibly can respond to. So it doesn't mean no if they don't answer you. In fact, they may not even open your email. So be prepared to phone the people that are on, that, to whom you have sent the emails and the actual printed letter. I still think it's a good idea to send the printed letter uh, because the printed letter, um, well, it's gonna be unusual. It's not going to be a, you know, a, a mass mailer type of thing and people are likely to open it. Anyway, um, people are very busy. Things get ignored. Don't assume it means no follow up with a phone call. Uh, and the timing for sending letters and emails and performing follow up um, is actually discussed in the second workshop. Now, creating the pro forma list of KSAs. 
do not assume that your current curriculum has all of the knowledge, skills, and abilities that you think em that employers are going to want in the future. Ask them through the KSA process what they want. The pro forma list is a starting point for discussion, usually 100 to 150 items, maybe a little more. The employers may add, subtract, modify any item on the list, and it may initially be mostly knowledge areas. So where do you get the information to upgrade a curriculum? And where do you get the information to start a whole new program? Well, lots of sources. I just finished updating the list of KSAs for the meeting that's going to occur for us tomorrow. Because up until last year, uh, with respect to IT, cloud was kind of still kind of new, but cloud is basically taking over IT infrastructure. So I got lists from multiple sources in the internet and updated the list that's going to be included tomorrow. You can identify similar programs at exemplar colleges, exemplary colleges, and start with their student learning outcomes and convert them to knowledge statements and skill statements. In some cases, there may be national skill standards you can use. There are also competencies usually listed for various certifications. If you know certain certifications are in fact very important. And in some cases, those people that provide or those companies that provide the certifications often will have a blurb about what they're looking for in the future. BLS has information, but understand that BLS information is 12 to 18 months out of date. Doesn't mean it can't be considered, but it's not going to have that, that future focus. Same thing for Career One Stop. And if you're having great difficulties finding information, involve a, a small number of your lead employers and ask them what they're looking for in the future. We do that as well. As you can imagine that there, there will end up being duplicates, most likely if you just gather it all from all these different sources. Once you eliminate the duplicates though, drop those KSAs into a spreadsheet in preparation for creating the electronic voting forms. The electronic voting forms are done with Google Forms and Google Sheets, but we do actually start from the Excel spreadsheet. Here are the knowledge, skills, and abilities list for IT. I'll also share that with you. The average over to the side is the average of all the votes. We actually do tasks for IT. We, I, I don't think tasks are really necessary, but that's what we do. So we have in here, the knowledge is focusing upon concepts. And if we go down to skills, I'll try to not move this too quickly so you don't get, go crazy with it moving across your screen. Here's where we had our cloud KSAs last year. And now we're into skills. Skill in analyzing network traffic capacity and performance. Most likely these skills are going to be uh, skills that are developed in labs. Not always the case, but most usually that is what they are. We do still have some abilities at the end of this, but that is less and less important across the nation. More likely than not, they're moving the abilities that are specific to the content, the technical content up as skills. And then some of the items here like ability 10, ability to apply the organization's goals and objectives to maintain architecture or ability like a12, ability to correct, collaborate, 
most usually we're having a separate discussion on employability skills. And I have some documents and some plans on how to do that as well for IT, but that would need to be customized for any particular technical content. Any questions about that? I have a question. Sure. So the votes, are these just like a five point Likert scale? Oh, good question. Actually, I'm not showing you the one that has the votes. Let me see if I've got that on the other form. This, this actually is summarized, but here we go. This one is for welding. It's a one to four Likert scale, except it's not just a Likert scale. Four means the item absolutely has to be covered in curriculum. Three means it should be, two means nice to have, and a vote of one says take this item out of the curriculum. The votes, if you look up here in the, on K1 in columns E, F, G, and H, you will see the distribution of the votes. The distribution is two fours, six threes, two twos, and one one and the average is 2.82. Normally the cutoff is around 3.0, but this one's kind of close to 3.0. So as facilitator, I would co-facilitate with the lead faculty member or an administrator involved. And what I would suggest is when you have a wide distribution of votes that you discuss that with the attendees and they can tell you at that point whether or not there really is a disagreement. Sometimes we find that uh, people will vote for because it's specifically absolutely required for the particular business they work in, while someone might vote a one because some particular item is not required for them. And that's the sort of thing that faculty want to know. However, look down at K3, you'll see five fours and six threes, we might not discuss that one because that one is all fairly, you know, fairly easily together or fa fairly grouped. Um, typically it's the ones that are widely distributed that we would discuss, but the ground rules are that the built members have the responsibility and the option to discuss any particular item they want. What happens in the meeting is we show them a screen at a time and we ask for discussion or ask them to explain the ones that are rated all the way across. There's a distribution in all categories. Uh, and then we allow them to ask for anything else they want to ask for. Once we are through looking at the KSAs, we spend some time talking about what was not covered. What else is new that we did not identify? Is that helpful? Yes, very, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, some implementation challenges. I will bring up some questions that we run into uh, so that you will have answers. Sometimes there's a reluctance to schedule meetings that are that frequent. I will say that they don't have to be elaborate. You don't have to feed them a lot. The most important thing is to provide coffee if you're face-to-face. Um, and also schedule the meeting at a time when people can come. The one meeting is two to four hours now, and there's really not much way around that one. I will say there are techniques that I use to break up the meeting where we take breaks fairly frequently and we have quite a bit of interaction, but the two to four hour meeting is required. The other meetings are pretty short, they're an hour. Uh, and it does take time to build relationships. It's very important that you take the time to build the relationships. I truly have people on our built team that literally I can ask them, what are they doing on a particular date? And before they ask me why, they'll first check to see if they're available and then say, what are the business objectives that you expect me to accomplish on that date if I do whatever you you know, whatever I'm wanting them to do. I oftentimes will invite them to co-present at, for example, the ATEPI conference or at high tech. I will invite them to participate in national employer panels. 
Um, maybe I'm hunting for somebody to do training or do uh, education sessions, and maybe I'll ask them to do that. Also, there's a, a reluctance to conduct the vote. I think people think that the vote is gonna take a long time. It won't. I do recommend doing it at the first of the meeting. That's what we're going to do tomorrow morning. It's gonna be the first of the meeting. And the real reason we're doing that is to set the context for the vote for anybody who's new, and also to make sure they remember that four is the top priority. This whole process is a process that originated in the US Air Force. And it relies on the votes being four to one, four for top, one being loose, least. However, if I'm going to pick my first item in a list, I would humanly think more that one was top. And that doesn't work very well. It is very important to have uh, the vote and then also to have the free flowing discussion after the vote that is informed by the vote. But if you just discuss, it's very difficult to really come away with actionable information to modify the curriculum. Inability to find committed employers. There are ways to do it. And those of you on the call can reach out to me. I will help you with ideas to identify people. Once you get a core group of five or six people that have agreed to be involved with you, you can ask them for a warm introduction. In other words, a virtual introduction to their colleagues. And I won't say it's easy. This is probably the thing that requires the most dedication and time, but it's possible for you to grow your belt pretty readily. Difficulty getting institutional buy-in. Don't try to suggest doing the belt model for everything, every CTE program on a campus. I do have three colleges right now, though, that are systematically going through all their CTE programs and implementing BUILT. But don't start there. If you think there are problems in getting acceptance across the campus, go ahead and start with one program and the success will breed success. I have to tell you, I have never seen the process not work. It always works. Faculty fear losing control. I think I've hit that pretty hard all the way through. Uh, faculty are still in charge of curriculum. They're just better informed from the information from the KSAs. It's more than an advisory council. It's not a rubber stamp group. And it's very important that the built um, lead the work or co-lead the work. My current chairperson's on the left. The other one is on the right. That's when we finally let him off the hook because he was working primarily in Ireland, uh, but they're both still on the team and they'll be there tomorrow. Here's the summary slide from our built chair. We all want our students to become active employees. I think professors wanna teach the latest, <clears throat> greatest information to their students and the business leaders want employees that are able to hit the ground running and they wanna feel like their time is worth it. Questions. All right, thanks, Anne. That was awesome. Does anybody have any questions for for Anne? We have been using the model since two thousand, actually two thousand three. I started using it in two thousand one, but it, as a center, we've been using it since two thousand three when we submitted our regional proposal. All the way through, we have people that have been with us since that time, um, and they feel like it's worth their time to commit and the students, we try to bring out a student fairly regularly, one or more students for them to basically interview and talk to. And without exception, when we show the students that have in fact gone through the program that the built members wanted, they've hired them. It's really pretty cool. And after all, that's what we're in this business for. At least that's why I'm in the business. Questions? Oh, go sure. ahead, Janet. Oh, sorry. Um, I do, where we are in a, a relatively new build and getting new industry involved, and I get the whole WIFM business, what are, is there a most common WIFM at the very beginning? Obviously, when you're up and running and they, they see everything, 
it's more obvious. What is something that we can bring to industry to get their involvement? I mean, besides saying, oh, we have these meetings that we want you to attend, how can we begin really to build those relationships? That's a really good question. The most common with them is wanting to have a wider pipeline of very well-skilled entry-level employees and that to choose from. It doesn't mean they're gonna hire every one of them, but they get to choose from very, very, very well-skilled employees or entry-level job candidates. And what it does is in effect, it boosts the qualifications of the entire American workforce. Every time one of these belts works, the curriculum is modified and the students going through it have the right skills. Thank that you. works really well. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Greg? Yes, Anna, I just have a comment and that is that, as you know, I. Uh, asked permission and participated, attended one of your built uh, meetings, and I was really impressed with the participation and engagement of the of the and the number of people that participated. So, uh, just kudos. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Yeah, you, uh, nobody asked me this, but I will say it's a good idea to have ten people show up for the vote so that you don't have the vote skewed in one particular area or another. Um, our, our meetings are the result of 16 or 17 years, I guess it's 17 years now, of our actually being in existence. And uh, we have a large group. Sometimes we have 90 people attend our, our meetings. They aren't all employers. All of our 80 colleges have the opportunity to send faculty and staff to here the latest information. Um, any one of you who is interested in sitting in and hearing what's going on, you are welcome to send me your email. I gave you my email there and I will send you an invite. It takes some time to get it going, but it's really, really worth it. Um, it's pretty cool. Any other questions? I'll turn it back to you, Jared. All right, no, thanks. I'm looking really, I'm excited to get the built started with the Mintech. Um, we've actually had our first couple of meetings and I'm, I'm really looking forward to year two, um, have it evolve and, and get, it, get it even more uh, implemented in our center. So thank you, Anne, for You're welcome. Uh, the built talk and thank you everybody for, for showing up.